Well, we have uh, the last two chapters in the book of Genesis today. Uh, and, of course, this last section that began in chapter 12 with Abraham covers the life of four people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Um, but today, I think we'll see the, the reason that in chapter 38, the story of Joseph was interrupted with the uh, evil lifestyle that Judah, the tribe that is uh, uh, appointed to be the line of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Uh, and then chapter 39 just began with Joseph again, and we saw how God brought back uh, his, his people who were destroying themselves. Uh, of course, that's a picture of Christ's second coming, uh, where he designated seven years at the end of, of this age that we live in right now. It was sometimes called the church age. Uh, is specifically set aside to bring Israel back to himself. And of course, along with that, a great company of Gentiles as well. So many that you that can't be counted. Um, so the, the book of Genesis tells the whole story. And what I think is remarkable about it, again, the first 12 chapters is a microcosm of uh, of the entire Bible, beginning with creation and going to the Tower of Babel, which is a type of the tribulation period. Uh, but then the last section, last major section from chapter 12 to chapter 50 uh, is a microcosm of the Bible as well. Uh, it doesn't begin at creation. It begins with the calling of Abraham and the building of the people that are going to ev eventually be called Israel. Uh, and in uh, from 12, chapter 12 to chapter 50, uh, it goes all the way to the Lord bringing back Israel to himself after they have been scattered all through the, the uh, world, the Lord's going to bring them back and bring them back to the promised land. We begin to see that when Joshua led the people out of the wilderness and led them into Canaan land, that's called the promised land, that was really only a type of the kingdom. And it's the kingdom where the Lord is going to bring Israel back and all the Gentiles that made it through the tribulation period, didn't take the mark of the beast, and the church, all in the, in the kingdom here. And this is what, what we're uh, pointing to. That's what the book of Genesis does. And I, I think it's marvelous that the Lord set it up, that the first 12 chapters point to that, and so do the last from chapter 12 to chapter 50. We're going to take a look at it today, and um, we'll see why God interrupted the story of Joseph with um, the evil lifestyle that Judah was, was, uh, was living, and the Lord's going to bring Judah back, as, as we'll see that. We have this in three parts, the study today. Pretty easy to remember, it's before Jacob's death, at Jacob's death, and after Jacob's death. Before Jacob's death, uh, Jacob is going to, God's going to use Jacob to prophesy over his 12 sons. 
And uh, the first part is very, very important. It begins with, with uh, of course, the firstborn, Reuben, and it goes all the way through. But the prophecy of, uh, of uh, Judah is, is just absolutely amazing. And we'll, we'll see that. Uh, and then Jacob is also going to show uh, his faith just before he dies, and it'll be carried out after he dies, his faith in the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, Jacob's life was was uh, was an interesting part of Genesis too, as we saw a scoundrel. His name even means supplanter, and uh, the Lord visited him. And the Lord used Jacob mightily over his, his uh, uncle's house in Padan Aram. And, and uh, uh, then Jacob, after he uh, met his brother that uh, he had escaped from, wanted to kill him, uh, disobeyed God, didn't go back to his father's place, but lived in Shechem for a while and just about destroyed his family. Uh, but Jacob, of course, was brought back to the Lord. And the last part of Genesis is all about God preserving the, the you know, the, the people of Israel. And of course, God does that because he said he was going to do it. Those people can be wiped out because the, there's going to be a remnant saved in the uh, uh, during the tribulation period. And then after Jacob's death, we're going to see that that uh, Jacob's uh, that Joseph's brethren are going to, since their dad died, be afraid of Jacob again. And we'll see how how that out. So three parts, before Jacob's death, at Jacob's death, and after Jacob's death. Let's begin. Uh, before we pray here and go to Hebrews chapter 11, we read 21 verses last week. To begin, let's read 22 of them this time. And I, I think this is, uh, I don't think at all that we could understand faith if we don't understand the book of Genesis. Hebrews chapter 11 is usually called the faith chapter or the hall of faith. And there's many people listed in the book of Hebrews that demonstrated faith. You need to remember that faith is knowing that God's going to do what he said he would do. And faith is in God's word. Out of this, Hebrews 11, 22 of them uh, relate to Genesis. I think this is amazing. Let's read this. Hebrews 11, 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We have to realize that in chapter 10 of Hebrews, uh, which begins the idea of faith, uh, in as the the reading goes in Hebrews, and it tells us that we need to hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, because He is faithful, who promised. We need to hold on to our faith to the end because God is faithful. And Hebrews eleven is called the Hall of Faith. And then chapter 12 is all about because we're encompassed by so many, such a big cloud of witnesses, how should we then live? And of course, we should live by that walk of faith. So chapter, I mean, verse two, for it, by it, the elders obtained a good report through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witnesses, a witness, excuse me, that he was righteous, 
God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6, but without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, things not seen as yet, moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house, by the which condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not out, knowing whither he went. He didn't know where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, which means tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him, of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Now, I hope we can see in especially these three verses here that Canaan land, when Abraham was there, and when David was there, and Solomon was just a type of that kingdom because these people were in the land of promise, but they sought a country. It's telling us that that is a type of the kingdom. That's where we're headed. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. The Lord pointed that out in the book of Genesis. I mean, to follow the Lord, uh, Isaac and, and Jacob both had to go back to Padan Aram to, to seek a wife. Esau, of course, uh, married the Canaanite people. That didn't work out very well. Verse 16, but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And we see that this city that the Lord hath prepared is the kingdom. This is what he said in John 15. This is in my father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you and he's going to come back and he's going to take uh, the people that have walked with him back with him uh, and be with him forever by faith Abraham when he was tried offer up Isaac and had received the promises offered up his only begotten son we can't miss this right here as being a type of Christ on the cross with, with uh, Isaac being the type of Christ. Uh, but of course, Isaac couldn't die for the uh, sins of the people. 
So there was a ram caught in a thicket. But when Isaac was lifted off that altar, undeniably a type of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By faith, Abram, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. That's the only time in the Bible that only begotten son is designated to anybody else except Jesus Christ. Point blank, telling us that, that this is a type. Of whom it was said that in Isaac, thy seed shall be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also received him in a figure. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. This we, we talked about last week. And now Hebrews 11, 22, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. <clears throat> so we're going to uh, see this today unfold the very end of, of Genesis and next week will begin in Exodus. And you notice how this verse 23 begins? By faith, Moses. We'll see that in the book of Exodus. So would you pray with me here before we start to read God's word here in Genesis 49, and we'll go to 50 and see what the Lord has to tell us today. Father, I come before you right now, Lord, and I, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit will encompass each and every person uh, that's that's uh, listening, participating, uh, and glorifying God as we go through your word, Lord. Uh, open our ears, open our eyes, so that we can receive what you want to to uh, impart to us today that we can that they'll be written on the table of our heart that we can not sin against you and and can uh, glorify you in our walk down here and live with you forever i pray lord that you'll teach this study uh, and uh, lead and guide our thoughts and our speech here so that only your pure word uh, comes out of this. We love you, Lord, and looking for your appearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's begin in chapter 49. And remember that, that uh, uh, Jacob is going to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, prophesy over his 12 sons. Genesis 49, verse 1, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. You notice that this begins here by saying, in the last days. This is not a prophecy. It's only concerned with uh, uh, immediately after the words have spoken or you know several years afterwards or even several millennium afterwards this is the last days now that that's pointed out here and i may tell you that which will befall you in the last days it says gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, 
and hearken unto Israel, your father. You notice that Jacob's called Jacob and Israel. Verse three, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest that thou it. He went up to my couch. Now, you know, Reuben lost his birthright, but he's not the first one in the Bible that did lose his, his birthright. We also saw that with, with Esau. Can we see that the Lord was broadcasting what was going to happen here? That Joseph and, I mean, uh, Jacob and Esau story was not just a story about Jacob and Esau. It was also telling uh, them then and we today about the birthright. And why is this birthright important? It's important because uh, man himself lost his birthright. Adam was the firstborn. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us this. And by one man, sin entered into the world. But by one man, the only begotten son, you know, that sin was, was taken away. So the Lord is broadcasting this from the very first book in the Bible. So he begins with Reuben. Let's see how this birthright came out. Let's, let's go to First Chronicles 5. And you know that Chronicles is a history book. And so it's reiterating the history. Need to remember that Reuben was was Jacob's firstborn, um, but his actions made him lose his birthright, and we'll see here where to whom it is uh, given. Verse one. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but so for so much. As he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. And that genealogy that it's talking about is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That's not reckoned by man's idea of birthright. And the Lord was, was telling us that even back in the story of Jacob and Esau in the book of Genesis. In verse 2, Jacob fled because Esau wanted to kill him over the birthright. You see that the Lord is telling us that in, in the very next sentence there, that it has to do, or it's the same thing, as we saw in the story of Esau, and we saw with Jacob. We see it here with Reuben. Point number two here, uh, what I have down here, that Joseph prophesies uh, that the tribe of Reuben will be unstable as water and will not excel. Now, I shouldn't have put Joseph here. This should be Jacob. but it was the Lord speaking through Jacob. Jacob prophesies that the tribe of Reuben will be unstable as water and will not excel. Point number three, Reuben's birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. The right of the firstborn as latter in law was given a double portion. Uh, that's covered in the law later on in Deuteronomy chapter 21, but but here can we see that Reuben lost his birthright. And that's the reason last week we saw Jacob blessing the two sons 
of Joseph. Later on in the law, you, you notice that God put in the law that the firstborn had a, a double portion. Well, there's no law here, but the Lord is going to take the birthright away from Reuben and he's going to give it to Joseph and Joseph's going to have a double portion. So Manasseh and Ephraim were blessed by uh, uh, God. And we saw Jacob, uh, you know, being God's vessel that, that uh, imparted that, that double portion last week. We saw it. And this is why when we get to the latter part of uh, the book of Ezekiel, that's talking about the kingdom and eternity that we see in some cases 14 tribes. And as we, we go through the Bible, uh, even in, in Revelation chapter 7, where, where it's listed, we, we, there's 12 tribes there, but uh, the tribe of Dan is missing. Uh, you know, they have different tribes in there. The book of Ezekiel kind of, of uh, points out that there's really 14 uh, tribes. But here it's in the first book that God explains why. It's because way back, Jacob's first son, from his own actions, lost his birthright. And it was given to, uh, uh, to um, Joseph as a double portion. And his two sons were Ephraim and Manasseh, and those two were two tribes. Even in Canaan land, um, in fact, Ephraim was the largest of all the, the 12 tribes. So this is broadcasted here, forecasted in the book of Genesis. Now, the birthright of the family dominion, you see this birthright is in two parts. Uh, the oldest son uh, in, in those days would, would carry on the family traditions. Uh, and he also got a double portion of the inheritance. Well, here the Lord divided this, this inheritance and the rulership into two parts. And he, he gave the inheritance part to Joseph as a double portion, as later on the law would, would, uh, would put in place. But we see here that the birthright as far as the family dominion or the carrying on of the tradition of the family. You notice what it's going to say? From whom came the chief ruler? That chief ruler is none other than Jesus Christ. Telling us that the, you know, the line of Christ is going to go through Judah. So, to, to boil it down, Reuben lost his, his birthright. And the birthright's in two parts. The firstborn um, would be the head of the family uh, after the father died uh, and uh, was given a double portion. Well, that part was given to Joseph. Joseph had a double portion in the inheritance with Manasseh and Ephraim. But the, the uh, leader of the family uh, was, was given to, uh, to Judah. And we saw last week that Judah was brought back. He repented right in front of Joseph as the, the dream that Joseph had, had dreamed from the very beginning that they, they were out gathering sheaves. 
and Joseph's sheep were bowed down to by the, the others. In other words, his family was going to bow down to him. When it came to that point, and um, the brothers were facing uh, Joseph, they didn't know that it was their brother. Joseph knew, of course. And Joseph had had his own silver cup in the grain sack of Benjamin because Jacob, in the first place, did not want Benjamin to go to Egypt to get food. He says, I already lost one son. Joseph is, is, is no more. Don't want anything to happen to Benjamin. But of course, he was forced to let Benjamin go. And now Benjamin is a thief and a servant over in, in Egypt. And Judah is the one that stood up. We read it last week and said, let me stand in Benjamin's place. I'll take his punishment. Um, that is what Adam should have done in the very beginning. Uh, instead of after Eve was seduced by Satan to eat the forbidden fruit, that, that uh, uh, Adam should have gone to God and said, let me stand in her place. But he didn't. He failed that, tri that trial that he was going through by sinning. The Lord broadcasted all of this from the very first book of the Bible. Only God could write a book like this. <clears throat> and this prophecy tells us that the land of inheritance here is not talking about the Canaan land in the time of Abraham or even in the time of, of David. But it's talking about what's going to be the kingdom. It's going to be right there in Jerusalem, right here on earth. On this same earth that we're, we're on here. Headquarters are going to be in the, the top of Mount Moriah there. Where the, the um, Temple Mount is. But it's going to be at the time of the kingdom. And that's what's prophesied in the Abrahamic covenant. And, you know, we saw immediately that this prophecy, this first prophecy about Reuben, um, came to pass. Because out of Reuben, who lost his birthright, and the prophecy was he'll never excel. And he didn't. There was no noted judges or kings or prophets that ever came from the tribe of Reuben. That's an amazing part of the prophecy right there. But can we see how much is explained by Jacob here, by God giving him a word and he's blessing his sons. Verse five, now we're gonna to go to Simeon and Levi. And you might remember that these two brothers are the ones that, that uh, planned and, and uh, executed the terror attack on uh, the people of Shechem. And so they are listed together in this prophecy. Verse five, Simeon and Levi are brethren, instruments of cruelty, are in their habitations. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, into the assembly. Mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they digged down a wall. Uh, dig down a wall means you form genocide. You, 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 you kill off a whole group of people. That's what Simeon and Levi did. Verse 7 says, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and will scatter them in Israel. Can we notice that Jacob? It's called Jacob. 
and that he's called Israel. Can we see now the difference? He'll divide them in Jacob means he's going to, to scatter them over the world. Uh, you know, as the descendants of Jacob. But the Lord is going to bring Israel back to himself. So he's called Jacob, but he's also called Israel. Simeon and Levi, Joseph's second and third born son, are blessing together because they orchestrated the terror attack on the Hagarites. And there you can see it in Genesis 34. Joseph prophesied uh, that their anger was going to be cursed. And Jacob prophesied that God would scatter them in Israel. It appears this really hit the tribe of Simeon. The tribe of Simeon was third largest, but 35 years later, it was the smallest. It didn't take time at all to see this prophecy come through. How could Jacob have known this? I mean, he was dying when he was, was giving this. The tribe of Simeon later shared Judah's inheritance of the land. So they even kind of lost their land and, and, and went over to Judah and, uh, uh, you know, lived there. The tribe of Levi stood with Moses as the golden calf, and this is the difference. Both of them are going to be scattered. And Simeon was, was scattered through Israel. And so was Levi. But Levi, his scattering was a blessing. And why was it a blessing? We'll see that when we get to Exodus chapter 32. When the golden calf incident and the nation of Israel, while Moses was up getting the, the tablet on the top of Mount Sinai and God was up there and the, the, the mountain was full of smoke and uh, it was shaken and the, the voice of God sounded like thunder. The people were down there worshiping a golden calf saying, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. And Moses stood up there and said, as he came down from the mountain, he saw that and he went over and he says, who's on the Lord's side? And it was none other than the tribe of Levi that all went up there with Moses. And the others were killed. Uh, so that because of that, the um, Lord, uh, the, you know, the tribe of Levi didn't have land because they were priests. But the Lord scattered them in Israel. I, I think this is an amazing prophecy as well, that both Levi and uh, um, Simeon were scattered in Israel. Simeon's wasn't a blessing of the Lord, but Levi's was. Because in chapter 32 of, of Exodus, Levi is going to make it stand for the Lord. Verse 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Could we have, when we were in chapter 38, could we have even thought that that would happen with Judah? He was living an evil life. He did everything wrong because he never consulted God. And we tried to point out there that this interruption in chapter 38 was, didn't have really anything to do with Judah himself or Joseph, for that matter, either, who was interrupted there. His story was interrupted. But it's about Jesus Christ. And that is what 
this prophecy is going to bring out. Let me begin again in verse 18. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word for my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father and an old man and a child of his old age, a little one. And his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. Um, I remember that Joseph and Benjamin was uh, uh, the, the children, uh, sons of Jacob that, that uh, Rachel bore. Uh, and uh, Joseph was, uh, as far as Jacob realized, has been uh, killed by wild animals because Jacob had sent him off to see his brethren. Uh, that's why he didn't want Benjamin to go to, to Egypt. Verse 21, And thou saidest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidest unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. Now, this is Judah talking, and he's reiterating to Joseph everything that happened. And he says to Joseph, you're the one yourself that said, I needed to go back to Canaan land to my father and bring Benjamin over here so that you would believe our story. Verse 24, and it came to pass when we came up unto the servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. He said, we told him your words. And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down if our youngest brother be with us. Then will we go down? For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, ye know that my wife bare me two sons. That's Rachel bore two sons. And the one went out from me. I said, I said surely he is torn in pieces. And I saw him not since. And if you take this also from me, and mischief befall him, you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I came to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow, the grave. So here the whole story has been given to Joseph. Joseph, uh, you know, can hardly contain himself, but uh, he doesn't let on that this is bothering him so much. But Judah continues, for thy servant became surety for the lad of my father, saying, if I bring him not unto thee, then I will bear the blame to my father forever. He says, I'm the one that went to my father and said, let me take him. I will be responsible for this. And it's the guy of chapter 38 that wasn't responsible for anything that was right. But he is uh, changed now because the Lord put him in a situation here and Judah had to make a decision of whether he's going to follow the righteous way or he's going to follow the unrighteous way. And that's the whole purpose for the tribulation period, the last seven years of this age for God to bring his people, Israel, it's going to get really bad, worse than it ever has been or ever will be. So that Israel 
needs to take a look upon him whom they pierced and decide whether they're going to do the righteous thing or not. That's what the tribulation period is for. And what we're reading here with Judah's account is the type of that tribulation period. Verse 34. For now, how, excuse me, shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come upon my father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word to my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, that's Joseph, they think is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, that is Benjamin, and his father loveth him. And thou saidest unto thy servants, bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidest unto thy servants, except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall not see my face. Excuse me, you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came up to thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down if our youngest brother be with us. Then will we go down, for we may not see the man's face except for youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, You know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces. And I saw him not since. He thought that because the brothers had, uh, had taken the coat of many colors that was given to Jacob, I mean, to Benjamin, excuse me, Joseph, by Jacob. And they dipped it in animal blood. So Jacob thought that his son, uh, um, Joseph, was dead by a wild animal. And of course, the brothers had sold him into slavery. They never imagined that the one standing before them would be their brother. Verse 29, And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. Can we notice here in this testimony that, that Judah, the one that had lived the terrible life in, in chapter 38. Now he's, he, he says, let me stand in his place. But, but Judah is not feeling sorry for himself. He's, he's not thinking about himself. He is thinking about his father, Jacob. Can we notice that? There's no pride in this. This is telling the righteous truth. And Judah is explaining to his brother, who he doesn't realize is his brother, the, the importance of Benjamin and Jacob, um, you know, being reunited. Verse 32, for thy servant became sure, surety for the lad unto my father, saying, if I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let not the lad go up with his brethren. 
And we see that that uh, Judah is saying, I, I stood up as a bondman for my brother. So I gave my word, and now that word needs to be carried out. So let me be your servant, and let Benjamin go back to his father. That's a complete turnaround. That's repentance uh, on Judah's part. The Lord prepared this, uh, this period here of tribulation in Egypt to bring Judah back to the Lord. Can we see that this is a type of the seven-year tribulation period? that the Lord set aside so that, that uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah is going to bring his people back. This is forecasted in the first book of the Bible. Yeah. Verse 34, For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come upon my father. Judah saying, I'm not afraid for myself going over there, but how can I go back home and face my father when Benjamin is in Egypt? So we can see we, we read this already in chapter 44, but I knew it had to be a part here that, that we can see Judah's repentance. And he wouldn't have repented uh, if this tribulation period, uh, so to speak, the type of the tribulation period hadn't happened. And Israel would not be brought back to the Lord unless the Lord had the seven year tribulation period, um, you know, designated to bring Israel back. The Lord had all of this planned from the foundation of the world. We've got to be able to see that God wrote the book. Back to Genesis chapter 49, verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ coming uh, to the earth at his first advent, and he stooped down. That's a prophecy of him dying. He couched as a lion. He's just waiting. We see in the book of Revelation that all of heaven is looking for someone that's righteous to uh, um, bring back the inheritance of the earth. The earth has been taken away by Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet. But nobody's worthy. So all of heaven thinks, who's going to rouse up the old lion that's crouched there? Who's going to rouse him up? He's going to rouse himself up, isn't it? It's the Holy Spirit that's going to bring him back. And we see that in the book of Revelation. This is a prophecy of that. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. This is further explained when King um, Balak of Moab was afraid of Israel's camp next to Moab. Um, you might remember that the prophet uh, 
really wanted to curse Israel, God came to him and said, you can't curse what I blessed. And, uh, and so Balaam did not do that. Uh, the, the king of Moab wanted Israel to be cursed because he looks down there and he sees Israel has more numbers than he himself. They're larger and eventually they would take him over. Uh, this is part of the prophet. We'll see that also in the book of Exodus. Verse 11, behold, there is a people come out of Egypt would cover up the face of the earth. He's saying they are so big, they cover the whole earth. That's a euphemism uh, for, uh, it doesn't mean everybody on earth, but there's a great number. Come now, curse me them. For adventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. Uh, here's the, the story of Balaam. We won't go through that. We, we have before. But I would like to take the last part of it here. Remember, it was that, that uh, Balaam didn't want to curse Israel because God had come to him and said uh, that... Uh, you can't curse whom I blessed. Verse 24, behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood slain. Do you see that it began to be prophesied in the book of Genesis? And then in the book of Numbers, it gives more detail. Still years and years and years and years and years before it's going to happen. But uh, this lion that is crouched down that, that uh, Jacob had prophesied about is going to rise up, but he's going to lie down until the point that he eats the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Or as Psalm 110 says, the father speaking to the son, and he says, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is the prophecy here. And Balak said unto Balaam, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, told not I thee, saying all that the Lord speaketh that I must do? In other words, the Lord told me, I, you know, the Lord blessed them. How can I curse them? This is what he had to say. The whole reason for that story was to point out, give us more detail of the prophecy that was begun in the book of Genesis. Chapter 49, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from beneath, between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. You know, if we don't understand the Bible in context, especially beginning in the book of Genesis and going through, we would be like many have. And there's many commentaries and many papers written, uh, many doctrines written, that there is a, a Bible crisis here in this testimony because it didn't come true. Of course it came true. But let's take a look at this for just a, a minute or two. It says the scepter, that means that the ruler shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now this shows us the importance of Isaiah chapter 11, because the Lord is going to take away the human kings in Israel. He prophesied it first in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 11. He's actually prophesying it here in Genesis. However, it wasn't so clear 
un until we get to where we are, we can see what the Lord was was actually saying. Uh, but he says the scepter will never depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver uh, from beneath his feet, between his feet, until Shiloh come. And that's a reference to the second coming of Christ. It also, of course, refers to the first coming of Christ. But nonetheless, 500 years before that, the Lord removed the human kings. Do you see that the human kings was not what the Lord was talking about here? The king that's being talked about is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ obeyed the Father. As Philippians 2 says, even unto the cross. But he rose again the third day. He's at the right hand of the Father right now. He's obeying the Father right now as our high priest. He is the Prince of Peace, and he's going to bring peace at God's appointed time. He is going to come down and he is going to gather his people. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we see it's not only the Jew that God had in mind, but he had also a great innumerable company of, of Gentiles that are saved during the tribulation period. And the church has been raptured before the tribulation period begins. Genesis chapter 49 says this in a vague way, but we can see the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. You know, the, the, the scripture that, that uh, the scripture reference that uh, I think interprets this so that we can understand it the best is Revelation 13, 8, where it says, Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God planned this all out before the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ came down and, and obeyed it uh, explicitly. He is the only one worthy. And we see him in chapter six of the book of Revelation, lifting off those, those tabs from the uh, inheritance of the earth. And things start to happen during the tribulation period, and Israel is going to be returned to God. Um, this was also forecasted in Psalm 2. I won't go there right now because of time, and we've done that several times read that several times as well. This scripture could not be broken. Jesus himself said that in uh, uh, John chapter 10. Let's come back down here to Chapter 49, verse 11. Let's go back to Judah's prophecy. It was binding his foal <clears throat> unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Isn't this amazing? There's three parts to this prophecy of Judah. And we just saw uh, the fact that, that the Lion of Judah is going to be roused up. But here, verse 11 is going to tell us how. Again, this is the first book of the Bible. And he is going to come down riding on a white horse. And his garments are going to be red. But his army that's behind him are all going to be dressed white. And righteousness. 
This is the first book of the Bible. And it's talking about Christ's second coming when his garments are going to be read. As it says in chapter 63 of Isaiah, who is this? With his garments uh, read from Basra. In verse 12, his eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. It's going to stand out. That is Revelation chapter 19 with Christ coming down. Chapter 49, verse 13, Zebulon shall dwell in the haven of the sea, and he shall be for an haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zidon. You take a look at a map uh, that uh, of the 12 tribes, in Canaan land, you'll see that Zebulun is up there, uh, not too far from Sidon, which was uh, the the uh, uh, Phoenicians, uh, the the uh, merchants, the rich people of the world at that point. This is a prophecy that Zebulun is going to to live there, and he did. He was right there on the sea coast, uh, not too far from Sidon. Verse 10, and the third lot came up from the children of Zebulon, according to their families, and the border of their inheritance was to Sarid. And their border went up toward the sea, Marala, and reached to Dabasheth, and reached the river that is before Jokneum. Issachar is a strong ass, couching down between two burdens, and he saw the rest was good, and the land that was pleasant, and bowed his shoulder to bear, and became a servant unto trouble. Now, see, Issachar was located between uh, his brother Zebulon that's over there by Sidon and his brother Gad that was, uh, you know, uh, half of the tribe of Jab went on the, Gad went on the other side of Jordan, on the east side. Uh, but that land by the Jordan there was, was very fertile, tall green grass. So here, uh, this is a prophecy of Issachar is going to be between his two rich brothers. And he's the picture here is he's a strong donkey that's that's crouching down between the two burdens, his two brothers, one at the sea coast, uh, very prosperous, and the other one uh, with uh, good pasture land. They had lots of sheep and goats. But Issachar is right between them. It's a prophecy of that. Dan, you might remember, is the northernmost tribe of Israel. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels, so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation. O oh Lord. You might remember that Gad means a troop, and that's what uh, he said here. Gad, a troop, shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at last. Verse 20, out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Naphtali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. Now here we get to Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well, whose branches run over the wall. Now this is what the Lord thinks of Joseph, who followed explicitly the things that the Lord um, gave him, the words that they gave him from the beginning with the dreams, and then as he went in Potiphar's house and was, was falsely accused, uh, as he was in jail, he 
he continued obeying the Lord. And, uh, and then uh, as he was interpreting the dream of the Pharaoh, the Lord exalted Joseph as the second in command, uh, as a type of Jesus Christ at his second coming. And the Lord prepared a, a um, famine in the land of Canaan so that the nation of Israel would be preserved in that, that big famine uh, as a type of the tribulation period when the Lord prefer, preserves miraculously the nation of Israel. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. He had arrows shot at him, it says here. But his bow abode in strength, and arms of his hands were made by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd and the stone of Israel. I don't know that the Bible ever talks about um Joseph ever shooting a bow and arrow. Nonetheless, uh, his, he was strong, and he was strong because it was the word of God that, that drove him. Even by the God of thy father, who shall help thee, and by the Almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breast and of the womb, and the blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brothers. Now here's the prophecy of Benjamin. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. And these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is that their father spoke unto them, and blessed them every one according to his blessing, and he blessed them. Can we see, remember what, what Jacob said, the Lord was giving him the word. He said, listen, my sons, and I'll tell you what will befall you at the last time, the, the, at the end of days here. And that is exactly what this prophecy was. It's, it's fantastic prophecy that the Lord gave. And it shows us that God wrote the book. And it also forecasted what's going to happen in the tribulation period. It is still future from us today. How do we know it's going to happen just like the Lord said? Because all of the local prophecies have been fulfilled. Even the ones that were hard to understand have been fulfilled. And we can see them now. So we know that the, the ones that are afar off uh, are going to be uh, fulfilled as well. Now, all of that was before Jacob's death. And Jacob was dying when he was, was giving that. And, and at this point, at uh, verse 29, and Jacob's going to die. But he's he's says here something very important before he does. And this demonstrates is the perfect example for his 12 sons here, because he's going to demonstrate his faith, even at the old age that Jacob was, that, that Jacob had faith in the covenant that God had made with his a grandfather Abraham from the beginning. Verse 29, and he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave 
that is of the field of Ephron the Hittite. Why does he want to do that? Because he knows the Lord is coming back, that the, the lion of the tribe of Judah is going to be roused up. He knows that's going to happen, and he doesn't want his body to be buried in Egypt. He wants it to be buried in that cave of Machpelah that Abraham had purchased the only land that Abraham really had, and he purchased it to bury his wife. Well, Jacob wants his family to carry his bones back there to the cave of Machpelah because he knows the Lord's going to return. Verse 30, in the cave that is the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The purchase of the field and the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. Verse 33. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet unto the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. So even at death now, Jacob is testifying that he knows God's going to perform what he said he would do. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 50, And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And 40 days were fulfilled for him, for so are fulfilled the days of those which were embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days. That's 70 days that, that uh, the Egyptians all mourned for, uh, for Jacob. Verse 4, And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now, therefore, let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, go up and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the house of Joseph, and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones, and their flocks, and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company, and they came to the threshing floor at Atad, which is beyond Jordan, and there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation, and he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Actad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. So we see here that Joseph uh, uh, made good the words of Jacob. He says, I want to be buried in that cave of Machpelah. So Joseph goes to the Pharaoh and says, I need to bury my father back in the land of Canaan. And the Pharaoh agreed and gave them chariots and everything that they needed to go and uh uh, take care of what they needed to do and then return unto Jordan. And when they crossed uh, the Jordan River, where the Canaanites live, the Canaanites saw this 
this morning that was happening even uh, outside of 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 uh, Egypt and said the Egyptians are really mourning somebody great here. They knew it was a big uh, to do here. Verse 13, and his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abram brought with the field for possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite from Mamre. And Joseph returned unto Egypt. He and his brethren and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. So there's point two, where uh, Jacob was testifying of his uh, belief in the covenant that God made with Abraham, even at his death. Now, we've taken a look at that uh, uh, before Jacob's death, and now at Jacob's death, let's take a look how the book of Genesis ends here with the uh, testimony after Jacob dies. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil that we did unto them. They are really convicted now. They said, now that dad is gone, Joseph is going to hate us. And he's going to mistreat us. And we're down here in Egypt and so forth. Verse 16. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, thy father did command before he died, saying, so shall ye say unto Joseph, forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren, and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of God thy father. And Joseph went when they spoke unto him. And we see here that the Lord has orchestrated this whole thing. Uh, the Lord didn't miss one detail. The Lord even had Jacob leave a message for Joseph saying, forgive your brothers for what they did to you. And Joseph, as soon as he heard uh, the request from his brothers, he went to him. Verse 18, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we be thy servants. Um, I'm sure that Joseph can now see the fulfillment in his lifetime of the his original dream. That here, all of his brethren are, are falling down on their face and saying, we'll all be your servants. Verse 19, and Joseph said unto them, fear not, for I... Excuse me, for am I in the place of God? Because I'm not God. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. This is a direct prophecy of the tri great tribulation period. Many times people have said, uh, why would God have the great tribulation period? at the end where it's worse than it ever has been or ever will be. Well, the reason is because man meant it for bad, but God meant it for good. Thus to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. This is why God did it was to preserve life. God bent over backwards to show us that the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel were going to annihilate themselves. They weren't living to God. They, they just uh, uh, were destroying themselves. And they have throughout history. And it's not just the Jew, but 
everybody else. But you know, there's one thing that's 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 absolutely amazing is that there is a nation of Israel still today after these so many years. It's because God has preserved them. And why did he preserve them? Because he said he would do it. The scripture cannot be broken. Verse 21, now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly to them. He didn't get after them. He knew they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Verse 22, and Joseph dwelled in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land where he swore Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath, the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. But he wants his bones and to be taken over there and buried with uh, with Abraham and uh, with uh, his father Jacob. And uh, he wants to be buried there as well. So we see the Holy Spirit that's going to rouse up the lion of the tribe of Judah that is, as the prophecy said, was crouched down. But he's going to rouse up. He's coming back the second time. And he's going to bring his people back to himself. That's the story of Genesis.